For 85 years, the Maroons of Jamaica waged war against the British. And for 50 years, the British, they would suffer defeat after defeat at the hands of a jobless Jamaican queen. With the help of the Most High, she would perform miracles of biblical proportions, freeing thousands of enslaved across Jamaica. She was more than just a queen. She was a high priestess who was an amazing warrior and gifted military leader. Indeed, she was the female Moses of Jamaica. I'm talking about none other than Queen Nanny of the Maroons. Yo, hold on, wait there. I want go on ya. Bridget, oh y'all go watch my sitting and now lick up my like button. Lick up the sitting, no man. And tell somebody about it. In other words, smash that like button and share it with a friend. It goes a long way in helping this video be seen by others. And if you ain't already subscribed, definitely hit that subscribe button for much more content like this. And if you'd like to choose my next video, then head on over to my Patreon, link in the description. Let's get back to it. What we know of Queen Nani mostly comes from maroon oral history and the accounts of surviving British soldiers. However, Queen Nani is the subject of many folk tales and stories among maroons. As outsiders looking to capitalize on these stories, they often publicize this information as fact. Many books, content creators, websites, and even Wikipedia publish incorrect information about her, including that she didn't even have children. But as one of her many descendants, it behooves me to tell the true story of Queen Nanny, or as we know her, Sarah Matilda Rowe. Queen Nanny, also known as Grandi Nanny, but as her descendants know her, Sarah, or sometimes Matilda Rowe, was born in the Blue Mountains of Jamaica, not Ghana, as so commonly believed. Rather, she was the daughter of Prince Naquan, a Fonti prince from southern Ghana who became enslaved in Jamaica in 1641. Under the guise of a trade agreement, he came to Jamaica, but was swiftly betrayed by his Spanish comrades, and he and his 600 men were sold into slavery. Naquan would of course defeat the Spaniards and flee to the Blue Mountains, where he and his 600 Fonti people would join the existing Spanish and Taino Maroons who have been there since the 14 and 1500s. Queen Nani was therefore born free in this community in the Blue Mountains of Jamaica. Her exact date of birth is not certain, as there exists too many stories that make it difficult to pinpoint an exact time. Some say she was born around the Spanish period, which would put her around 1650-1660-ish, which would make her around 8090 towards the end of the Maroon War. But most scholars settle on 1680s, which would make her around 50 or so at the end of the Maroon War. Although there were Taino, Carib, and Spanish Maroons, the Fonti or Coromanti population dominated the Maroons. Therefore, Nani grew up in a largely African community recreated in the Caribbean, and King Naquan ensured his children grew up via Conway. Queen Nani had seven brothers and at least one sister named Sakesu, with whom various folk tales are shared. Her brothers were Kojo, Akompong, Jani, Kofi, Kwao, Kwashi, and Kwako. 
And there was possibly another brother named Apong, or Opong. While I can't be certain what order she was born, it is believed that she was either born third, after Kojo and Akompong, or fifth, before Kwashi and Kwako. Part 2 Part 2 Hebrew Priestess Akohina Many people erroneously perpetuate the idea that maroon means runaway slave. However, many maroons were born free in the mountains, such as Queen Nani. In truth, the word maroon is an English corruption of the word marano which is a derogatory Spanish-Portuguese term for Israelites, calling them pigs. This is confirmed in a book called The Analytical Review of Our History of Literature, Domestic and Foreign, etc., etc., and I believe it was the 26th edition on page 266. It reads, The name Maroons from Morano, a pig. It is also the root of the word Maron and the word Cimarron, which is often given for the root word of Maroon. This fact is also confirmed numerous times by former Moortown Maroon chief Bev Carey in her book, The Maroon Story. Smithsonian anthropologist Kenneth Bilby, who lived with the Maroons and studied them in depth, drew many parallels between Maroons and Israelites. In his book, True Born Maroons, the idea that Maroons are Israelites is directly confirmed by former chief of Akumpong, Man Roe, and his father, Henry Octavius Roe, both of which are direct descendants of Sarah Matilda Roe. Maroons recount to this day that they come from 12 tribes that were in Africa. The Akan people of Ghana, from which she descends, have their roots in the city of Ashan, southern Israel, before migrating in 70 AD to Egypt, then to Sudan, and then to Sahel, before settling in Ghana. It is for this reason that we find many Hebrewisms in West Africa, and why in general Maroons believe that we are God's chosen people. Maroons maintain that her power comes from the Most High, rather than witchcraft or obya. Therefore, Queen Nani was not a witch, a sorceress, or an obya woman. She was in fact a kohina, a Hebrew priestess. In fact, the name Sarah is Hebrew, so is the name Matilda. Nani, according to our tradition, worshipped one God, the Supreme Creator, by whom the Akan languages refer to as Yankipong Kwame, or Yankipong for short, or Ya for even shorter. Interestingly enough, Yankipong Kwame translates to the God of Saturday. Jesus, aka Yahoshua, stated in the Bible, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, which is Hebrew for Saturday. In this picture, we see an Ashanti priest wearing what is clearly an ephod. For those of you who aren't aware of what an ephod is, the ephod is the breastplate of Aaron. The only people who wear it are people who are of the bloodline and unbroken paternal lineage back to Levi, as well as people like Moses. This means that this Ashanti priest is a Levite of the blood of Levi and Aaron and Moses, and therefore a Kohen. Thus, if the Kohen are among the Akan people, it is not hard to believe that Queen Nani was a Kohenim. Part 3, 
Queen of the Maroons. It is said that at an early age, Queen Nani displayed gifts that signified she was chosen. Gifts such as clairvoyance and hearing the voice of God, whom Akans referred to as Yankipon Kwame. Thus, her seven brothers trained her, each in their own specialty. At the age of 16 or 18, her seven brothers would all give to her the power of their jeges, which is a sort of power object, and they elected her as their queen. Some of the skills she had to learn included using the afana or a machete, throwing a junga or spear, shooting, maroon ambush, military skills, herbal medicine, and other high sciences. When the British took over the islands and set out to subdue the Maroons, or wild Negroes as they were then called, her brother, King Kudjo, would traverse across the island and unite all the Maroon settlements into one power to wage war against the British. While her brothers, Kudjo, Akompong, Kofi, and Jani, would venture to the west and settle there, Nani would remain in the great Negro town as it was then called by the British, but as Kudjo would affectionately call it, Nanitone, and left her in charge, Kudjo was required to make numerous trips a year visiting each Maroon town in order to keep the Maroons prepared and free. Nanitone, like most Maroon settlements, subsisted on farming and hunting. Maroon farmer plant al kainasin, then plant kyan, potieto cassava, ganja, and woolly pa planting. In fact, when the British discovered the Maroons' crops, they dubbed it the Great Plantain Walk. For acres upon acres of plantains were planted by the Maroons. Makes sense why I love plantains so much. Part 4. War Tactics and Strategy Intelligence Gathering Nani was said to be able to communicate with animals, maybe because of mystical abilities. In some cases, Maroons had spirit animals. But there's also scientific means by which humans could communicate with animals. However, said knowledge must have been lost to time. Just as people train carrier pigeons and horses, Maroons were said to utilize animals such as birds to aid in intelligence gathering. It is said that Nani herself had a Jabin crow whom she could summon. It could fly around and gather information on troop position. Another means of intelligence gathering was using visions. Nani's visions from God, as well as those of other Maroons, have saved the Maroon lives on numerous occasions. Maroons also received visions from their ancestors or fallen Maroon soldiers, giving them vital information. Various African drums, combined with ritual dances, induce states where Maroons could access spiritual powers as well as information from the other side. According to some legend, these dances could make them invulnerable. Aside from the spiritual and mystical aspect of the drums, there are practical aspects as well. The drums can be heard for miles in the mountains, so they developed a drumming language to warn other maroon towns and tell them what was going on without saying a word. The abeng is another such tool for communicating in long distance. It's not just unique to Jamaican maroons, rather, it's an African tool and is equivalent to the Hebrew shofar. A complex language was created using the abeng that only Maroons understood. And it was said that you can communicate a message from the eastern side of the island all the way over to Maroon communities in the west. There was also a network of invisible abeng blowers patrolling the mountains at all times. There was also the Slave Intelligence Network. Many people freed by Nani and the Maroons had relatives who remained on the plantation for one reason or another. And while they were unable to run, 
They were brave enough to help the cause by providing Maroons with vital information on the movements of the British government. A great part of Maroons' success in fighting the British was the location of their towns. They often chose remote locations whose footpaths required one to go over steep precipice and march in a single file. Often soldiers would fall to their death before ever reaching the towns. But of course, Nanina put all our eggs in a one basket. For she knew that in case they were discovered, they would need another base to flee to. So they would build multiple towns behind the towns. They would also build backup farms. In case their crops got destroyed, they would have another source of food. Nanitone Maroons, like all of the Maroons, employed what we call today camouflage. And long before the Revolutionary War, the British were getting their asses kicked by it in the Caribbean. Maroons would dress themselves as bushes so convincingly that they could stalk their prey for miles undetected. This style of camel was called ambush. As the Maroons mistook the word that the British were screaming ambush, within the British archives there are stories of soldiers who swear trees came to life and strangled and or decapitated their fellow officers. Now this tactic is employed by the US, so when you think about camouflage, just remember, Nani and the Maroons pioneered it. Another tactic the Maroons made popular and were the first to employ in the Western world was guerrilla warfare. Ironically, the phrase was coined from a battle between the British and the Spanish. In the 1800s, two groups who both got their asses whipped by Maroons with this tactic. So it's Maroon Warfare. Ambush, hit and vanish, hit and lead into a trap. With these tactics, they succeeded in defeating the troops who greatly outnumbered them, suffering very little, if at all, any loss. Part 5 Science and Miracles In addition to talking to animals, Nani is said to be able to fly to a degree, as well as heal quickly and see visions. But some say these are not miraculous powers, but rather Nani making use of her knowledge of high science. One such story that exemplifies her knowledge of high science is the story of Nani's pot. The story of Nani's pot has been told for centuries. In recent times, scholars have changed details to make it sound more practical. But this story deserves a video all its own. But the short end of it is that Nani created a pot with some particular herbs that caused the water to boil with no fire. And the fumes caused soldiers to walk into it uncontrollably to their deaths. There is also her ability to catch bullets. Nani was skilled at catching bullets with her hands. Bullet catching is not new, however, and apparently was common in Africa during these times. However, in addition to catching bullets with her hands, on numerous occasions, she also caught it with her... I don't know if I can say this on video, but... Uh, asshole! Maroon oral history in British records swear by this event. Last but not least is the story of Pumpkin Hill, so-called because when facing starvation, Nani had a dream in which Yang Kipong told her to plant the pumpkin seeds in her pocket, and giant pumpkins sprouted from it that very day. But that story also deserves its own video. Part 6 Freedom Raids Nani and her maroons would orchestrate many large-scale rebellions across the island, freeing thousands. The largest and most documented were in the middle of the island and were attributed to Kujo's party, who had settled in the west. While in the east, under Nani, there would also be spats of rebellion, freeing hundreds, leading up to full-scale war on the maroon towns. One of the most famous is the attack at Baths. Alexander Latimer, ran a health spa at a place called Bath, which was a natural hot spring discovered by Maroons, which is said to cure almost any ailment. 
It had been taken over by the planters, and slaves were banned from using it. So the Maroons assaulted it and took the slaves with them. Latimer requested a loan of slaves because the Maroons took every single one. Next, they carried out an assault on Port Antonio and liberated all the enslaved. The same would happen on the Mumbies estate, the Edwards estate, Titchfield, Bagnale. Even Colonel Nedham would lose his slaves to the Maroons, as well as the Orgill Plantation. It is from the Orgill Plantation that Nanny's second husband escaped. Imgobadiniam Swifomento, but the also known as Ros Harris, our grandpa Paro, better known as Paro. There was also an assault on the military barracks at the breastworks, which caused the enslaved on the nearby plantations to leave with them. There were also numerous smaller raids on smaller plantation in which a number of enslaved were also freed and became maroons, although it is uncertain to ascertain exactly how many people were freed in these assaults. During the 1700s, the maroons were so successful against the British, the number of runaways increased. In fact, the defeat of the British in several crucial battles led to martial law in the 1730s, which in turn led to many slave owners abandoning their plantations. Slave owners who stayed now found themselves at the mercy of their slaves. Dude. Man, fuck that white nigga. That's your master. I don't know that nigga. As they would threaten their master with calling the maroons on them. Thus work ceased, which tremendously impacted the British economy and had the potential to end the slavery system altogether. This event was recorded. All right, stop it. Stop it. Stop having so much fun. <laughs> hey, master, why don't you do me a favor and master these nuts in your mouth, nigga? <laughs> Nani and her maroons were able to defeat the British in several key battles. Too much to go into into this video, as each battle deserves their own video. But I'll quickly touch on some of the battles that the maroons destroyed the British in. These battles include the many battles of the plains, in which they sent different captains after the maroons in the mountains. Then there was the mosquito Indians that they brought from Central America to come track the maroons. None of them made it back. Then there was the three prong attack, which saw the capture of two or three maroon villages, especially Nanitown. But they weren't able to keep that for long. In the first two years of the Maroon War, they found that they killed maybe 10 maroons, while they had lost hundreds of British soldiers. Many of them died because of the harsh conditions in the mountains. In fact, the most effective troops in the British army sent to fight the Maroons were the Black Shots, which were former slaves, some of which former Maroons, who had signed up to get their freedom by hunting Maroons. The Black Shots, and I quote, for their part, were more effective than their white counterparts in hunting Maroons. In fact, it was a Black Shot, a former slave named Scipio, who was credited with killing Nanny. Of course, he only shot her, he didn't kill her. A black shot named Captain Sambo is credited with having been instrumental in subduing Nanny Town the first time. But even with the help of the black shots, they still could not defeat the Maroons. In fact, the British had to go back to England to get troops and then to Gibraltar on more than one occasion to bring troops all the way to Jamaica to fight the Maroons. One of the most famous battles in Maroon history is the Maroons versus the Seamen, whose graves would become those mountains. With the defeat of the Seamen, the troops from Gibraltar, the Mosquito Indians, and their economy in jeopardy, the British sued for peace on three occasions. The third occasion being the charm. They would first draw a truce with Kudjo in the west and then with Nani in the east. But it is her brother Kwao whose name is on the treaty. However, it is said that Nani and all her brothers except Kwako participated in the blood ritual instead of a physical treaty and the treaty was drawn up post-event by the British. 
Queen Nanny or Grandi Nanny or Fanti Rose or Shanti Rose also known as Sarah also known as Matilda Roa is celebrated every year amongst the Maroons but she is also a national hero in Jamaica and her face sits on the $500 bill there is also a family reunion for her every year she is symbolically the mother of all Maroons but physically she is the matriarch of some of the row family of the Maroons of Jamaica as well as many offshoots such as Pringle, Harris and various others. Her brothers Kujo, Akumpong and possibly Cuffy also took that last name. Matilda Rowe had four children, three sons and one daughter. Her first born was named Kwash Kwako and them call him Grandpa Puss. He was by her first husband, presumably Grandpa Joe. Her other sons, Kujo, named after her elder brother, and Ampong, as well as a daughter named after her, named Nani, were the children of Grandpa Swiplamento, making them Rose. On a journey to the west to visit the other maroon towns, she took sick and was not able to complete the journey, and she passed away. It was simply impractical for all the Maroons in the various towns to attend her funeral, much less to pay their respects to her grave whenever they choose. So to prevent infighting over which town she should be buried in, it is said that each Maroon town had their own funeral for Nani and had a coffin that was said to have Nani's body. Therefore, no one really knows where the real body is buried. Although some say that it's definitely in more town at a place called Bump Grave. There's plenty more about the life of Queen Nani that I'd love to go over in future videos, as well as other aspects of Maroon history. So if you enjoy this content and you want to see more, then hit the like button and subscribe. Hit the bell icon to get notified when the next one drops. And if you're in the position to do so and would like to see more black content for us, by us, then head on over to my Patreon and consider becoming a member. Until then, leave your thoughts in the comment section and stay tuned for more. Also, the main reason I do this content is because I want to support the Maroons back home in Jamaica. Currently, we're trying to raise funds to build a water system to have running water into the communities, as well as other projects of modernization. So if you're in the position of support and you enjoy this content, then you can head on over to that GoFundMe page, link in the description. Thank you all so much. Stay tuned for more. Jobless, one love.